This place is color and light. Darkness and stars. A sanctuary for the human spirit since time immemorial. And a refuge where animals and plants find a foothold. This place is a song where the verse, the voice of each season, rings out or whispers through forests and meadows, bending and swirling amidst spires and crags, commanding attention with each clap of thunder, cheering on the streams and seeps, flying on the wings of birds and arriving on the wind to tell of a past, present, and future and its name, Bryce Canyon. At Bryce Canyon National Park, the passage of time and the change it brings are on display. Sometimes change is fast, bold, sometimes slow and subtle. Formations reveal ever-changing faces through continual weathering and erosion. Nothing is static. Stars, born millions of years ago, blanket and brighten the vast night sky with constellations that change season by season. Species with deep evolutionary roots find a niche here. And people continue to come. Some since ancient times. Some for the first time. Bryce Canyon National Park, most notable for its bowl-shaped amphitheaters of oddly shaped pinnacles and colorful limestone cliffs, is also an environment of complex ecosystems, life zones, defined by elevation and geology, where communities of distinct plants and animals are found, and where predictable natural events herald the change in season. As days lengthen and temperatures warm, Bryce awakens. Across the high plateau, mule deer and pronghorn give birth. Animals emerge from dens and burrows. Male prairie dogs appear in early March, then late May for females with their young. For birds who overwinter and those returning from migration, spring is a time of rejuvenation. In meadows, snow melt fills the rivulets and seeps and streams in the bottom of the canyon trickle briefly, then remain dry until summer monsoons. Wildflowers begin to bloom in delightful colors and shapes. Varied hues of green signal new life in trees and plants. And light painting the amphitheaters creates an ever-changing palette of color as time moves forward. But to understand how this astonishing landscape came to be requires a journey back in time, deep time. 50 million years ago, this area of Southern Utah was covered by a vast, shallow lake system. Over time, layer upon layer of iron-rich sediment was deposited in the ancient lake beds over a thousand feet thick. Then, 10 to 15 million years ago, 
Geologic forces of uplifting and tilting formed a plateau over 8,000 feet high, revealing the sedimentary rock layers formed in the lakes. Called the Claron Formation, the soft rocks of white and pink, red and orange, were now exposed to the forces of weather and erosion. Spectacular amphitheaters were carved and sculpted into the awe-inspiring rock formations, the hoodoos. The principal factor going on in the formation of the hoodoos is a weathering process called frost wedging. And it's an alternating freeze-thaw cycle. So that when we look at the rocks, we see that they're full of cracks and fractures. Moisture gets into those cracks and fractures, freezing at night, expanding, breaking that rock apart, and opening up the fracture a little bit more. Then during the summer monsoons or during the spring runoff, that broken material gets removed, creating a fin. And then we get weaknesses within that fin that form windows. And as those windows expand and open up, the fin then separates into the hoodoos. This is a special place, and it's the reason why it was set aside as a park. The features that you see here are not unusual in the sense that we find hoodoos around the world. But here at Bryce Canyon, we have the world's largest concentration of hoodoos. And so no matter where else you go in the world, you will never see the things that you see here at Bryce Canyon. Intense sunshine and deep shadows paint the formations in dramatic light as spring changes to summer. Daily monsoon thunderstorms bring lightning and heavy rains, which wash away bits of weathered rock, furthering erosion. On a moonless night, 7,500 stars may be visible. It's a chance to explore a protected darkness that was once available to all. Bryce Canyon is profoundly dry, and because we're also at a high altitude, we have a very clear view of the night sky and all of the stars. One of the things that's just so impressive is the opportunity to see so many stars and almost lose your place. Over time, it's become apparent how important the vastness and the void and the darkness of the night sky is to all who come here. Like the rock formations, stars tell a story of deep time. Light from the Milky Way began the journey to our eyes just as humans arrived in North America 15,000 years ago. What is known about human history at Bryce tells us that people used the area as a base for seasonal hunting and gathering, drawn by the rich plant and animal life. Rice Canyon is a part of our traditional territories. The bands that lived up in here for the Southern Paiutes didn't actually live in the canyon. Passing through a lot, um, camping in the meadows, moving with the seasons and the animals for food source. Up here, there are a lot of meats, Prairie dogs, that was a staple. Hunting the antelope and the deer. When the Paiutes hunted the animals, you always gave it an offering and thanked it for giving its life because it's giving its life to sustain yours and your families. Everything here is sacred. We consider our entire traditional territory sacred land. And we don't pick and choose because we believe everything has a vibration. And you come into this area and there's different resources that you might not have had in other areas that you're so grateful for. With every new season, it's a renewal of life. The band that used to be here is no longer here. A lot of the bands are no longer in their traditional territory because they got moved out by the settlers that came in. So in our family, it's really important for us to take our children to our traditional territories so they know anywhere they go on their territory, there's a food source, they know what's there. We may not use that today for a lot of things, but we still practice gathering. We still maintain a presence. And for our family, it's really important to pass that knowledge on to our children. Who knows, one day they may actually need to use that knowledge to sustain themselves. By the 1870s, 
Mormon settlers like Ebenezer Bryce and his family arrived in the area and established towns and farms. To access timber, Bryce built a road that ended in an amphitheater of pink cliffs and which locals soon called Bryce's Canyon. Bryce and his fellow settlers also constructed irrigation ditches to supply water to homesteaders living in the arid valleys. The seven mile long tropic ditch still carries water to the valley, flowing down Water Canyon and through the park along the Mossy Cave Trail. For over a century, people have traveled to the Bryce Canyon area to explore its natural wonders. A young forest supervisor named J.W. Humphrey helped introduce Bryce Canyon to the world following his first visit to the Plateau Rim in 1915, where he was captivated by the beauty before him. Imagine my surprise at the indescribable beauty that greeted us, and it was sundown before I could be dragged from the canyon view. J.W. began a campaign of tireless and creative promotion, writing letters, inviting artists and photographers, offering naturalist tours, and arranging car trips to the rim of the canyon charging tourists one dollar with the promise of a refund if the view was disappointing. J.W. never returned a dollar. As interest began to increase, local homesteaders Ruby and Minnie Syrett built the tourist's rest lodge, serving meals and providing overnight accommodations to a growing number of visitors to Bryce Canyon. These early efforts by J.W. Humphrey and others led to the lasting protection of Bryce Canyon, first as a national monument in 1923, then a national park in 1928. The Union Pacific Railroad Company helped develop the new park into a tourist destination, providing funding for construction of the Bryce Canyon Lodge and deluxe cabins. Built in the rustic style, the buildings were designed to harmonize with their natural surroundings through the use of native materials and a design aesthetic sensitive to the natural landscape. Luxurious accommodations and gracious hospitality appealed to affluent tourists, many traveling by train and bus on Union Pacific's Grand Circle Tour, with stops at Cedar Breaks, Zion, the North Rim of the Grand Canyon, and Bryce Canyon, where they stayed at the lodge. Irma Bybee Clark, who worked as a housekeeper, recalls. The Union Pacific trains would bring people into Cedar City, and then they had these tour buses, and they would bring them out to Bryce Canyon, and they would stay the night. When they'd get ready to leave, they'd load the people up on the buses, and we'd all get in a circle and we'd sing to them. Since its establishment, the park has protected a diversity of natural environments that provide rich habitat for plants and animals. Rice Canyon National Park is home to the Utah prairie dog. The Utah prairie dog is a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act and only occurs in Utah. Each year, usually in May here at Bryce Canyon, we count the adult prairie dogs so that we can estimate the population. It's so important to have a native environment with native plants in the ecosystem because that provides a space for the animals to eat. It provides a place for people to enjoy a scenery that they may have never seen before. Part of the work that we do at Bryce Canyon in the vegetation program is restoration. Whenever there's a construction project or any kind of human disturbance, we like to go back in and sow native seed, plant native trees, because it brings the ecosystem back to the level that we like to see it. Bryce Canyon is home to some endemic species of plant that only flourish on the Clairon Formation, 
which is exposed here in the hoodoos. There's a pinstamen and a paintbrush. We also have some really beautiful rock columbine. Over millions of years, plants and insects have been co-evolving. Some insects only pollinating certain flowers and plants. Without these plants, the insects would be lost. Losing the insects means losing the plants they pollinate, affecting all species that rely on that plant for food. It's an interdependence that helps maintain the health of a native landscape. Each life zone at Bryce Canyon is determined by elevation and characterized by dominant plant communities, which influence what species of animal may be found there. Some animals and plants, though, may be found across several life zones. In lower elevations, pinyon pine and juniper, gamble oak and yucca, sagebrush and rabbit brush grow. Prime habitat that supports a variety of birds, the Great Basin Rattlesnake, and badgers. Equisetum, or horsetail, an ancient plant that predates flowering plants, is found in this zone in low-lying meadows. Moving higher in elevation, an understory of manzanita grows beneath towering ponderosa pine, trees that rely on fire to keep other trees out of their habitat. It's also a tree whose bark smells like vanilla or butterscotch. In the forests and meadows, commonly seen animals include pronghorn, hawks, and squirrels. At the highest elevation, mountain lions, elk, and ravens may be spotted in forests of white fir, spruce, and aspen with an understory of Oregon grape and manzanita. Also in this zone, bristlecone pines, some possibly 1,600 years old, survive, witnesses to an evolving landscape. Looking back to deep time, environmental changes led to evolutionary changes and adaptation by some species. As forests transition to grasslands, one animal common to Bryce developed unique characteristics in order to survive. The pronghorn we see today evolved from a species that emerged 35 million years ago along with other modern mammals. Eyes located high and on the side of the head give pronghorns a visual range of over 300 degrees and the ability to see long distances across open terrain to avoid predators. The pronghorn's massive heart and lung capacity give it speed and endurance, making the pronghorn the fastest land animal in North America. And this power to run fast, up to 60 miles per hour, begins at an early age. Fall begins with a flurry of activity and then a slowing down. Come fall, the pronghorn antelope are the first ones to leave. They go down to lower elevations and disappear from the park. And the mule deer, it all depends on how harsh a winter ends up hitting us. When we have a lot of snowfall, the mule deer will end up leaving as well and they'll go down to lower elevations. Utah prairie dogs, right around September, the big fat males, they'll be the first one to go underneath the ground and, and hibernate. And then the adult females will follow. And come October, the juveniles, the ones that were born just that same year, they're still trying to put on enough fat to be able to hibernate through the winter. So they'll be the last ones to go under and they'll probably disappear by October's end. 
The Uinta chipmunk, though not a true hibernator, still spends the winter underground, sleeping and waking occasionally to feed off food cached in the fall. In the amphitheaters, frost wedging resumes as colder temperatures set in. The sound of cracking rock ringing out at night. In the gentle light of early morning, frosty meadows glisten. A closer look reveals delicate ice crystals quickly melted away by the warmth of an autumn sun. Plants go dormant, their seeds scattering on the wind, and the leaves of deciduous trees, the aspens and the oaks, brighten the fading landscape with yellows and reds and golden browns, then fall like feathers before the coming snow. By November and December, the park is quiet. In winter, there is a harsh magnificence. Snow softens the landscape, blurring the lines between meadow, woods, and rock. Blowing snow creates impressive shapes, and ice adds a touch of dazzle to the wintry world. Glimpses of animals that winter over are caught at lower elevations, yet sometimes only footprints tell of their presence. And snow falling on the rock formations works its way into cracks and crevices in the ongoing cycle of weathering and erosion. Hardy visitors celebrate winter's offerings and the solitude the season brings. Being here in the wintertime is a completely different experience from other seasons. There's a beauty all its own, and in the stillness, you can actually hear the silence. As longer days and warmer temperatures loosen winter's grip, the snow and ice melt. It is the promise of a new spring, a new summer, a new fall, and a new winter.